Hey everyone, welcome to week 12 of Computer Science 225. This week we're going to start talking about the topic of shell scripting. Now shell scripting is when you create little programs called shell scripts that run in the command line. It's like writing little programs that are comprised of different terminal commands, different Unix commands, and you run them all together one after the other automatically. Shell scripting is really useful for a lot of different things. If you ever find yourself having to type out multiple commands to like do the same things over and over and over again, one of the great things about the command line is that you can automate those tasks by writing a shell script. For example, if you have a software project where you're doing lots of the same things over and over again, like you have one long command that compiles all of the code, one long command that runs the code on a bunch of different tests, and checks if the tests work or not and gives you a message and then uh, you know does things like that then you can take all of those commands and put them into a shell script so that you can run them all automatically just one after the other shell scripting allows you to basically take all of the commands that we've learned and put them into little programs to accomplish different tasks so today we're going to start looking about how to make shell scripts how to edit them, and how to execute them. And we'll learn some basics of shell scripting, like creating variables, uh, doing user input, getting command line arguments, which are really helpful for shell scripts, doing simple math, and uh, doing output, and things like that. So that's what we're doing this week. Then in two weeks' time, for the final week of this class, we're going to revisit shell scripts, and we're going to learn how to do a little bit more complicated things, more sort of like programming-related things. We'll look at, in two weeks, how to do if and else statements and loops and functions. But for today, we're just going to start by keeping it simple by writing sort of basic shell scripts that will allow us to automate simple tasks. So let's pull up a terminal window, and we can get started. All right, so a shell script is basically just a text file. So we can create text files the way we have been doing all semester with the vim command. So I can write vim and I'll make a simple one called hello. Shell scripts can end, can end in the suffix .sh for shell. Uh, they don't have to. We, don't, we could just call this hello if we wanted, but I'll call it hello.sh to sort of keep it simpler. Then we can basically just put commands inside of here. We can do things like say echo, hello. This is a command that we have seen. The echo command prints things out to the screen. By placing it in this file, we can make it so that when we run this file as a shell script, this command, the echo command, is going to be executed by the shell. So I'll save and quit out of this. And now we have this hello.sh file here. And there's a few different ways that we can run it. The first is to run it by passing it to the bash program. Bash is the name of the shell. If we look at it, we're already running bash. If we run the ps command, this is the shell that is executing now and is taking in our commands and is interpreting them. We can tell bash to execute all of the commands in a particular file by running bash hello.sh like this. And then we should see the hello message that's generated by our script. There's other ways to run this. If we wanted to, we could run it directly. To do that, first of all, we would have to give it the execute permission. By default, when you create files, they aren't given the execute permission because they're assumed to be just sort of regular old text files. But we can give this file the execute permission for ourselves with the chmod command. If we want to give just us the command, the permission to execute it, it'd be chmod u plus x. Remember that's user, which is us, plus the execute permission on hello.sh. And now if we list this again, we should see that it has this execute permission. ls, when you run it with the color option, it uh, colors things that are executable in green instead of yellow. And so now we see this hello.sh is in green. So now I can run it a different way. I can run it by giving the path to the program by doing dot slash hello.sh. I can't, however, just do hello.sh. Um, actually, maybe I can. Uh, I can do that because I have edited my path in my dot bash profile to contain the um, current directory. So in my bash profile, I have set it up so that the path environment variable contains 
home faculty I Finley bin, so I can put programs and scripts in there and I can run them without having to give the full path. The original path variable and also my current directory, which is dot again. So uh, if you haven't done this, you won't be able to just run it directly like this by just typing the name of the file hello.sh. So it sort of depends on how your path is set up. I think by default, the dot does not uh, is not included in your path. So if you want that, you would have to make it so that your um, path includes the dot, which again, you can set in the bash profile. Go back to week six, I think, if you need uh, to refresh on how the path environment variable works. But anyway, if we have it in our path, if we have dot in our path, we can run it just as hello.sh. If we don't, we have to run it as dot slash hello.sh if it's in the same directory as us. Of course, if it's in another folder, we would have to like navigate to that folder and, and do it like that. There's another thing that we can put inside of the shell script that has to do with how the program is run. And that is what's called a shebang, a shebang uh, which is something that starts with a pound sign and then an exclamation point, and then has something like this that would say slash bin slash bash. This is called a shebang because it uh, contains the two symbols, the hash symbol, and then the pound, or sorry, the uh, exclamation point, which is sometimes pronounced as bang. So we have hash bang, which over the years, I guess, got shortened to just shebang. It's, if you Google it, it's uh, S-H-E-B-A-N-G is the name for this. Uh, this construction, this hashtag followed by the exclamation point or the pound symbol followed by the exclamation point or whatever. And what this does is this tells the um, shell when it goes to run this program, what command to use to run this script. So by default, because we're using bash, it will just use bash if you don't have this here. But you'll often see this in shell scripts, and so we'll use this in our examples. This is a comment, because uh, anything that starts with a pound sign is a comment. But the special comment that is followed by the exclamation point, when it's the first line of the shell script, tells the interpreter, the, the script, uh, the shell, what command to run our script with. If we wanted to, we can do this with like Python programs. If we wanted to, if we, if we change this to like user bin Python, then this isn't going to work anymore because this isn't valid Python code. Um, oops, we also don't have, oh, uh, my bad, we don't have, it's, the command is not just Python, but rather Python 3. And now if we run this, it's going to try to write it as a Python program. And as you can see, it, it doesn't work because this isn't valid Python code. So this first line, the shebang, it sort of tells us what interpreter, what shell program to use as the program that runs the rest of the script. So in this case, because I put Python 3 here, it tries to run it as Python code. And so I should, oops, I should do something like this, like print hello. And now I can run it as a Python script instead. But because we are doing the um, uh, bash scripting, I will change this back so that it's bin slash bash. If you want to find out where a certain interpreter, a certain shell lives, you can use the which command. So if I say which bash, you can see it's in user bin bash. Um, it's also in just regular bin bash, though, so we can do it either way. Um, if we want to see where Python 3 lives, we can say which Python 3 and see what it is there. There's other shells besides bash. So for instance, if you wanted to use a different shell in your shell script, you could put it inside of this shebang line, and then it would use that other shell instead. But for now, we'll just keep this as the bash shell. So like I said, anything that starts with a comment, except for this sort of first line, is a comment. Anything that starts with a pound symbol, I should say. So we can put comments inside of here just like we could any other sort of programming language. Anything that starts with the pound is ignored up through the rest of the line. So if I run this again, it will behave exactly the same. It uses this first comment, the shebang comment, to figure out which interpreter to run the program with. Any other thing that starts with the pound sign is just ignored. OK, the next thing to talk about is variables. So let's say we want to greet the user by name, and we want to say hello, and then their name. We could just say hello, Bob, or something like that. 
or hello Susan, but then we would have to go in and change this where it is. Instead, what we can do is we can use a variable to keep track of their name. So I'll say name equals Susan, like this. And then inside of here, we can reference dollar name. So there's two parts of using variables. One is to assign the variable in the first place, and that's done with syntax like this, where we give the name of the variable, which in this case is just name, and then immediately we have the equal sign. And then inside of quotes, we have what it is equal to. Then when we use the variable, when we make reference to it, we prefix it with the dollar symbol. So we don't just say hello name like this. If we did that, it would literally print hello name. We indicate that we're using a variable in bash by prefixing it with the dollar sign. And as you can see, Vim does a good job of coloring this so that we can sort of understand what's going on. Without the dollar sign, it just leaves this in the teal color, which makes it, uh, it indicates that this is just the string hello name. Whereas when we put the dollar sign here, it colors it blue to indicate that this is actually a special symbol. It's a variable name, um, which is in fact called name. So now if we run this, it should say, hello, oops, it should say hello Susan, because that's what the variable is equal to. Notice that even though this is inside of quotes, the variable name is still replaced. We'll come back and talk about that more in a sec. But first, I have to tell you that the syntax for bash is extremely picky. If you program in Python or Java, you can put, and in fact you often will put, spaces on either side of this equal sign, like this. That I think looks better um, when I write code in C or in Python or Java or whatever. I will put spaces on either side of the equal sign to sort of let the statement breathe a little bit. But this will actually not work in bash. If we try to run it now, it says, Line three, name cannot be found. This uh, syntax is very picky. Now it tries to run name as a command. The equal sign has to be immediately up against the uh, thing that it's setting equal to, the variable name, and the thing that it is setting it equal to, which is in this case the string Susan. So that's uh, that. Another thing that might, you might find odd is that the quotes here are actually optional. If we run this without the quotes, it will still work which looks very weird coming from a Python and Java background, if those are programming languages that you're familiar with, because in those languages, you have to put things in quotes for them to be considered strings. Otherwise, they'll be considered variable names. And if you did the equivalent of this in Python or Java, you would get an error message saying, the variable Susan cannot be found. But Bash is in some ways more picky than Python and Java. It's more picky with the exact syntax, like spaces and stuff. But in other ways, it's a lot more flexible than those languages, a lot more forgiving. It will just treat things as strings if it is able to do so and it makes sense to do so. So here, it because there is no dollar sign in the beginning of this, it just treats it as the string Susan. And so you can run it like this, and it doesn't have any sort of problem with that at all. Um, so that's uh, maybe cool or not, depending on how you feel about it. But if you have, let's say, a last name here as well, like Susan uh, Morris, and try to greet the person by their full name, then now it's not going to work anymore because it will try to find Morris as a command by itself. And so in this case, if we have spaces inside of the name, then we do have to have the quotation marks to indicate that all of this together is one string. And now when we run it, it will recognize it as such. There's another way that we can reference these variables besides just placing a dollar before them. And in this case, it's not necessary to use it. So let me come up with another example. Let's say we want to make a script that does backing up of stuff. It will make backups of things. And so let's say the file we want to back up is data.txt. And let's say, as part of doing this, we want to make the data.txt, and we want to have data.txt and then backup at the end of it. So we might say something like this, like copying dollar file name to dollar file name backup. Like we want to literally put the word backup after the end of our file name. So it'd be data.txt backup. Maybe that's not the best way to name it, but it'll demonstrate this problem that, that, that we'll need to, to address. So here we reference dollar file name as this variable, which should be replaced by data.txt. 
Then when we get to this one, as you might be able to gather ahead of time, this uh, bash has no way of knowing where the file name ends. And so if we run this like so, it will say copying data.txt to blank, just empty. It didn't say data.txt.backup. This indicates another way that bash is sometimes uh, more liberal with things than other programming languages, because we didn't actually get an error message for using this unexisting variable name, file name backup. Instead, it just said copying data.txt to nothing. If you use a variable that doesn't exist, it will just be the empty string, which sometimes isn't great. It might be better to uh, have an, an actual error message, which is why Python and Java and other languages are a little bit more rigorous. They will actually make sure your variables exist. Bash doesn't. If the variable doesn't exist, it just uses an empty string. Uh, basically, the variable is empty equal to nothing. So, But in this case, we want to mark where the variable name starts and ends. And we can do that by putting these curly braces around the name of it. So now, and you can see that Vim's uh, text coloring reflects this, now the variable name is just dollar file name. That will be looked up to get its current value, which is data.txt, and then backup should be appended to it. So if we run it again, we should see that that's the case. Now it's copying data.txt to data.txt backup. So you always can use the curly braces if you want to. You could do it like this every time. But you only need to do it when it sort of needs that for the context. Here we need that because we're immediately appending text after it. And so we need to sort of be specific about what part of this is actually the variable name that we're trying to reference. All right, so these quotes, as we can see here, work and Bash accepts them. There's also another type of quote that Bash has, which is the single quotes. We can say copying dollar file name to dollar file name backup again. And um, here, as you can see by the highlighting, the way that these quotes work is actually a little bit different. Now in Java, the single quotes are only used for single characters, whereas the double quotes are used for entire strings. In Python, the double quotes and the single quotes mean the same thing. You can use them uh, interchangeably. In Bash, they actually have a different sort of way that they work. The double quotes allow this variable interpolation, is what it's called, when we sort of take a variable and replace it in the string with what its value is. So as we've seen, this won't say copying file name to file name backup. It'll say copying data.txt to data.txt backup, because these variables are interpolated inside of the double quotes. That means like they're substituted and replaced or whatever. With the single quotes, that doesn't happen. A single quote string in Bash is like a literal string. It's going to give us exactly this text. And we can see that if we run it here, it gives us literally this text exactly as it appears. So you can do this if you don't want any sort of replacing shenanigans to happen inside of the script. For example, if we do something like this, you owe me $4 inside of here, and you owe me uh, $4 inside of here, we probably wouldn't want the single quote version of this because this is going to replace it with um, the value of the variable for, which actually has a meaning in Bash, which we'll talk about, whereas this is going to literally print out the, the, the number 4 as, as sort of do, uh, $4. And so if we run this one, this first version with the double quotes, tries to do string in, interpolation. And because the variable $4 doesn't actually exist in this context, it just gives us the empty string back. Whereas this one doesn't. It puts in literally the value $4. So if you ever like need to use dollar sign or braces or anything like that as actual parts of the string, then you could use the single quotes for that purpose. This can be used sometimes on the command line as well. So like for instance, if you want to echo something like uh, a star symbol, like uh, that, then it will expand out to uh, be equal to all of the things that you have currently here. So the star will expand out to all of these things, and those things all get printed. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Whereas if we say echo 
single quote star, then it will actually print that out. So this is a way of sort of saying, no, don't do funny business with this, like literally print this thing out or literally use the symbol. Okay, so one thing that's important, like we said, is that with the quotes, either the single quotes or the double quotes, they're optional in some contexts. Like here, the quotes around this is optional because this is just one single word of text. There's no spaces in it. But typically, I will always use the, the double quotes. I typically always use double quotes by default unless I have a very specific reason to use the single quotes to avoid the interpolation thing. And that's probably a good habit to be in when you are doing bash scripting. Sometimes if you don't use quotes at all, like you do it like this, sometimes you can get weird things happening that you didn't expect. So typically, I'll just use the quotes as default. So that's that. Um, there is another type of um, quote that we can talk about, which is the um, backtick quotes. So let's say we want to tell the user what day it is and say, well, so, so let's say we'll do this. We'll say name equals, again, uh, Susan Morris. And let's say we also want to tell Susan what um, day it is. So we have it just like this, name equals Susan Morris, echo hello name. This is sort of the first version of this program. Let's say we also want to say what day it is. Well, we could run the date command like this. Um, oops, not fate, date. Date gives you the, the, the current day and time. If we put this in our program and say date like this, however, um, oops, uh, let me see, what was I doing? SH. It will print it out. But let's say we want to get just a part of this. We want to get just the day of the week, which in this case it prints it as fry. Well, first of all, let's say we want to get just the day of the week. So that actually can be done. Date has lots of different um, formatting things. If we want to get just the day of the week as the whole name, we can do date plus percent A. You can, of course, consult the date man page to see all of the details on how you can get all the stuff. But plus A is the full weekday name of the date, whatever it is. So I'm recording this on a Friday, and so it gives us Friday. Well, again, we can put this into the program. We can say date plus percent A. And that will print out Friday when we run it. But let's say we want to tell them happy Friday. Well, we could put a happy before to this. And then it will give us, hello, Susan Morris, happy Friday. But let's say we want to put it on the same line. Well, to do that, what we want to do is we don't want to just run the date command. Instead, we want to run the date command and capture the output of it and stick the output of it in a variable. There's actually two ways to do that. Um, the first is with these um, backtick quotes. So we can say something like day equals, and then inside of backticks, we can do it like this. We can say uh, the date plus percent a command, which gives us the day of the week, run that command, and then stick the results of it into the variable. Then we can just say happy day like this, referencing our variable, and now it should say happy Friday when we run it. And of course, if you ran it on a Tuesday, it would say happy Tuesday instead. So if we run this one, this works. Now we're capturing the results of this command, whatever we put inside of here, and we're sticking the output of it into the variable day. There's another way of writing this, however, which is sort of the more modern way of doing it, which is to say dollar sign and then in parentheses have the command. The reason for doing this is I think that the backticks need to be escaped if you have them nested. Um, they're both very common. Either doing the backticks is very common or having the dollar sign in parentheses way is also common. Um, this is technically the preferred way of doing it if you look at like the bash documentation and stuff like that. Um, so we'll, we'll do the rest of the examples using this sort of more modern syntax for it, where we have the dollar sign and then in parentheses goes the command that we want to execute. It works the same way. Hello, Susan Morris, happy Friday. The script works the same way, whether we use the backticks or not in this example. But uh, like I said, these are, these are said to be more modern and preferred, so we'll go with that. So let's work on a little script that will make backups for us. Let's say we want to be able to use this program, this script, 
to make a backup directory if it doesn't already exist and copy files into the backup directory. So to do this, let's begin. Let's say we want to start by sort of keeping track of maybe what file we want to pass in, uh, what file we want to make a backup of. So we'll say file is equal to, in our home directory, um, let's say we want to back up a file called stuff.txt. And let me actually make this file. It's not txt. Um, we want to make a backup of this. Now in hello.sh, so we know this is the file we want to make the backup of. Next, let's put in a comment because that's good and say that we want to make a backup directory if it doesn't already exist. We'll say make the backup directory if not there already. For that, we can use mkdir p. But dash p will do a couple of things, including uh, it tells the mkdir command to not complain at us if the file already exists. And let's say in our home directory, we want to make a file called backups. So make this directory if it doesn't already exist. That's fine. Then we want to copy the file into that directory. So I'll say copy the file in. So um, we could start by doing a simple thing like this. We can say copy dollar file, and I can optionally put the curly braces around it, but I don't really need to because I'm not putting something directly after this, into home slash backups. Now, if I run this command, it should copy the stuff.txt file into our backups directory. So let's go ahead and try and run it. Um, and let me change the name of it. Let me, instead of calling it hello.sh, let's call it backup.sh. So now if I run this, if I run backup.sh, it should not have. Hmm. OK, so uh, I forgot about this. This is sort of um, obscure, but oops, I forgot I renamed it. Inside of our backup.sh <laughs> file, uh, the tilde isn't, uh, it doesn't get expanded inside of double quoted strings. Um, it's just something that on the command line itself we can do. We could do this though. We can say dollar home here, and that's an environment variable that we can use. And so now it should actually work. Let's try it again. Um, definitely uh, forgot about that. When we run backup.sh, now it works just fine. And so now this has created a backups directory. And if we cd into the backups directory, we should see that stuff.txt is here. And this is the file that we made a backup of. So let me go back to the home directory, clear the screen, and um, open this file again. Yeah, I forgot about that. You can't, you can't put a tilde inside of the double quotes. It doesn't actually expand it in that context. Here you can, because the this command as it's given whole is given to the um, to to the shell. If we took the double quotes off, it would actually I think have worked, but it's it's fine. We'll do it like this instead. So this is the file that we want to um, make the backup of. Now, a few things. One is that if we change this file, stuff.txt, adding a new line, and then run the backup script again, then at this point, it will overwrite it. So if we look in the backups directory, then we've overwritten the file with this new one, which is fine. But let's say we want to be able to make multiple versions of this file. Every time we run our backup.sh, it makes a new version of it and puts it in there so that we can keep them all straight. Now, one way we might want to do that is we might want to affix the sort of date onto the file so that we can keep them all straight. So one way we could do that is by using this handy date command again. So we might want to figure out sort of the timestamp so that we can put that on there. So let's, um, let's quit out of here. If we want, we can go back to this date formatting thing and find one that works for us. So if we do date percent %a, that gives us just the day of the week. That's not very good. We don't want to just have stuff.txt-friday. We want to have like stuff.txt- like the full date and possibly time as well. But we can add more things onto here. 
um, besides just having uh, the date like this. We also might want to say like um, Y I think is for the year and then we can say dash percent M which will give us the month dash percent D gives us the day. It's March 31st, 2023 right now as you can see and I think um, H, no, H gives us the hour, yeah, 10. And then um, percent M should give us, that's the month again, that's the minute, 1027. And that's probably good. We'll keep track of the date that this backup was made down to the minute. So we made this backup today. If we made it right now, it should say like stuff.txt dash. 2023-03-31-10-27. That way, if we run the backup script multiple times, as long as it's not in the same minute, it will keep all of those versions inside of our backup directory. So let me copy this version of the date command, and we'll open up our backup script again. And now I'll say, maybe I'll call it now equals dollar sign parentheses, and then we'll put all of this inside of it. And so now, instead of copying the file into just tilde backups, we'll do tilde backups. Let's do it. Let's do it this way instead. Let's um, let's get rid of that and just call it stuff.txt. This will make it a little bit simpler, actually. Then we'll um, put it in as dollar file dollar now. So with the hyphen, actually, that separates the different words, so we don't need to do the curly braces around it. But if we are not sure or we want to just make extra sure, we can go ahead and do it like this as well. That'll be just fine. So now what the script should be doing is it should take this file stuff.txt. It should get the current sort of timestamp as we designed it, year, month, day, hour, minute. Then it should make this backup structure if it's not already there. It is in this case, but that's OK. Then we copy dollar $file into the backups directory with the name dollar $file dash, and then the timestamp should be appended onto it. So now if I run this backup.sh file, it should have put into the backups directory stuff.txt with the timestamp sort of appended onto the end of it. That way I should be able to run this backup script multiple times, and every time I do it, it will make a new file inside of here. So this could be like a helpful little thing that we have if we aren't using git for some reason, if we want to just sort of make backups of our files so that if we need to go back and find them, we could. It might be helpful, though, if we don't hard code it to be stuff.txt. It would be nice if we could like give our backup script the name of the file that we want it to make the backup for. Like here, we can do stuff.txt. In another instance, we can give it like program.py or main.java or whatever and make it backup those files instead. We can um, do that by using these dollar these sort of special arguments that give us the command line parameters. So let me make up another script again. Let me open up hello.sh again. We can put the shebang in there. Uh, bash, yeah. So there are special variables that come with bash that are things like this, like dollar one, echo dollar two. These will refer back to the first, second, and third command line arguments that our script is given, if it's given any. Go chmod plus sex hello.sh. And then I can say, if I just run hello.sh just as it is, these variables will all be empty. Dollar one, dollar two, and dollar three are all empty. However, if I run hello.sh and then I say, um, hello there, man then $1 will be hello, $2 will be there, and $3 will be man. What you put on this line gets passed into your shell script as its command line arguments. That's how programs like Vim and Copy and all those things get the things, the, the arguments that you give them. Those aren't all necessarily shell scripts. But inside of any program, you should be able to get the command line arguments, the things that come after the program that you're running on the command line. This is how we can get them in bash. If they're not there, like we said, they're just empty strings. There's a few other special ones. We can say echo you passed in dollar pound arguments. This is the number of command line arguments which we were given. 
So now it was three arguments. In this case, it was zero arguments. The dollar pound variable gives us how many arguments total we got. We also can pass in dollar zero. And if we run that, that is actually the name of our program itself. So if you ever want to get the name of the command, the path to it, you can look at $0, which will always be there. That was the name of the script itself that is running, essentially. There's also um, all the arguments are dollar, uh, dollar splat or dollar asterisk. It gives us all of the arguments together in one string. So if we run that, all the arguments together are hello there, man, in this case. So these are how we can access these sort of special variables, the command line arguments. So if we go back to our backup script, rather than have the file hard code it to be the name of a specific file, we can read it in as $1. And that will capture the argument, the file that was passed on the command line, and use that as the file that we want to make the backup for. In theory, we should check if the file isn't given as an argument, but we'll see how to do that in a couple of weeks when, you look, when we look at doing if statements in here. But for now, we'll just assume that this file is here. Now, if I run backup.sh, I should be able to pass in stuff.txt, and then that makes this uh, backups directory. Now, if you see, we have a new one that was made at 1035. But we can also now run this program on other files as well. Let me see what other files I have. I can go into, let's say, um, project one. Maybe I have things in here. Yeah, I have some Java files in here. Now I can run my backup.sh script on book.java. And I can run it on main.java. And I can run it on uh, catalog.csv. And now all of these should be copied into this backups directory. So if I go in here and look, now we have, in addition to the two backups of stuff.txt, now it also took these Java files and this catalog file, and it copied them into this backups directory as well. So being able to reference these command line arguments is super helpful. It lets our scripts be like run on files and things like that. So that is uh, one cool thing we can do, one way of getting input. Another way of getting input inside of a bash program is with asking the user to actually like physically type something in. And that is done with this read-p command. So we can say read-p, what is your name? This is sort of like the input command in Python or the scanner in Java. And then we should be able to say um, echo hello dollar name, like that. Here, uh, oops, I, I forgot. Um, we also have to give the name of the variable. So the way that read works is it, this dash p option is to give it a prompt so that it will print out sort of like a prompt for you to enter something. And then you give the name of a variable without any dollar sign or anything. And the way read works is it will assign into this variable whatever the user typed in. So now we can reference dollar name and get that printed out. So now if we do hello.sh, it'll say, what is your name? Now the script is like interactive, and I can put in my name, and then it will greet me by that name. So the read is for getting like sort of input as the program is running. I'd say, though, that it is more common in shell scripts to get the input from the command line arguments, like reading it in from $1 or $2 or whatever. But you can do it this way. You can have it ask what your specific name is. We also, there's also this option for it, um, dash s, which stands for silent. And that way you can read in things like passwords or secret things if you want to. Um, echo your password is $PW. And so that way, if you run it, it will not, uh, rather, it won't echo back your stuff to you. So when it says enter your password, I can type in like, um, something like that. And now it reads in whatever I typed silently. If you noticed, um, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I is not my password, by the way. But uh, if, you, if you notice, there was no space here. So um, the um, 
read lets you start typing immediately after the string, which is why I put the space in there. And then if we wanted to, we could sort of have um, an extra sort of like little empty echo to print a new line. So if we care about getting those things sort of exactly right, I can say like uh, over there. And now uh, it, it sort of reads it in. So the, the read command is for reading an input either when it's echoed back out to you, which is the default, or if you do dash s, it doesn't echo it back out. And then you can type it in like secretly if you want to. But like I said, I think it is more common for um, scripts to get their input usually from the command line arguments. All right, there's one last thing to talk about, which is how do we do math in a shell script? And uh, this is something that might come up. So let's write a little program that takes in two numbers and adds them together. This is the sort of basic thing that you might do in like the first or second day of comp sci 110 or 220. So we can say, like, what is the first number? And then we can read again for the second number. And I'll call these like num2 and num1. Then we might want to add these together. And that is done using dollar sign and then double parentheses. So if you have dollar sign single parentheses, it runs that thing as a command and captures the output back. Um, if you do double ones, though, it will do math on them. So then we can say num1 plus num2, and then close the double parentheses. And then we can say the answer is, and then we can say dollar answer like that. So now if we run this, hello.sh, first number is 7, second number is 4, answer is 11. That sounds right. So uh, of course, we can use other things as well. You can put in um, more parentheses, and you can put in um, addition and times and divide and all the sort of sort of like normal arithmetic operators inside of here. So as another example, if we wanted to do this, let's say inside of our backup script, instead of adding the end of the um, uh, file storing sort of a timestamp, what if we wanted to have it just increment a number, like 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5? Well, we can do that by keeping a file that keeps track of the sort of number that we're currently on. So I'll make it a hidden file called .current backup number. And inside of this, I'm going to start it with, let's say, 0. That's the starting number. Then we want, so the, the, the way this is going to work is this dot current backup number, this hidden file, is going to be keeping track of what number we should be using. So now I want to append the number onto the end of this instead of the current time. Uh, so what we'll do is first we have to like load the current value of it. So I'm going to say number is equal to, and then I'm going to read it in with cat. Cat, if you remember, takes a file name and it just prints it out to the screen. So I'm going to use this to write the current backup number. So I'll do in my home directory this file dot current, I'm going to call it backup number. We cat it, and then because this is in the dollar parentheses, it takes the output of that, which should be the number printed out, and it puts it into this number variable. So that's sort of the first step. I'm going to then use that number as sort of the suffix here. So let me go into this backups directory, and let me remove all this stuff just to make it simpler. Now, if we run this backup script, backup.sh, on stuff.txt, now in the backups directory, it should make stuff.txt-0. So this is sort of the first step of this. We are reading in the current value of this file, which is 0 to begin with, storing it in the variable number. And then we're appending that onto the file name. So now it'll be stuff.txt0. But now the thing we want to have happen next is the next time we want this program, the next time we run it, it should say stuff.txt-1 and then stuff.txt-2. So what we want to do is we want to overwrite this file with one more than what the current value of it is. So we want to increment the number in this current backup number um, file. So here's what we'll do to do that. We'll say we'll echo, and then we'll say inside of dollar 
double parentheses, we want to do dollar number plus one. We want to do that. And now we want that to go into the dot current backup number file. We can use our output redirection to do that. If you remember, this was something that we covered a few weeks ago. It takes the um, output of a command and puts it into a file instead, overwriting whatever was already there. Backup. So all of these things are helpful and build upon each other. This code right here should take number, whatever it's currently equal to, in this case it'd be zero, add one to it, and because it's in these dollar double parens that should like, do that math, that should give us the value one, then we overwrite this file with that text. So let's see if that works. Um, I should remove the original backup slash uh, stuff.txt zero first because it'll, we, we didn't have this in the program originally, so it, it won't do it right now. So now I'll run this again. I'll say backup.sh on my stuff.txt. Now inside of backups, it should have put stuff.txt zero. And now in my current backup number, if you can see it incremented it to one. So now if I run it again and again and again, inside of this backups directory, it should be adding stuff.txt zero and then one and then two and then three. And inside of the current backup number, it should be equal to four. So now we've sort of created this global counter that's stored in this file so that we can increment it whenever we want to and use it to keep track of sort of what backup number we're on. This is just one example of what you can use all of these tools to build. Um, when we get to uh, week 14, the last week of this cl class, when we talk about the rest of the shell scripting material, how to do if statements and functions, then I'll show you some of the shell scripts that I have that solve real problems that I sort of use every day. Um, but even with what we have now, these are sort of helpful things. Even being able to just put multiple commands into a file so that you can run them all at once is super helpful. If you have, like, um, I can't tell you how many times I have like a simple program where there's a long command to compile it, and I'll just shove that in a cell, shell script so I can just do like dot slash build, and it does the complicated compiling commands. Stuff like that is really helpful. So. That's all for this week. Like I said, in two weeks' time, we're going to revisit this material and learn sort of how to do if and else statements in Bash and how to do loops in Bash. Those two will really be helpful. We can write more complicated things then. We'll also look at how to do functions in Bash, which is also a pretty cool thing. So that's all for this week. I hope you all have a good week. Talk to you later. Bye.